conducting this uh, presentation with some other people who could not be here today. So I'm now recording it. So before I start with the presentation, I actually would like you to watch a very short video, just sort of as, a, as an introduction to the subject of rewilding. And the way we're going to do that is I'm going to put the link to the YouTube video on the chat and you guys can watch it on your own computers because if I share it here, probably the quality won't be great. Uh, it's a one minute long video. I'll share the link and then we'll restart in about a minute. So here is the link. Please watch that. Okay, so that should have been about one minute. Did you guys manage to watch it? A few people have just joined. We were watching a quick YouTube video. The link is there, so you can all uh, <laughs> watch it later. Okay, so that's about a new National uh, Geographic documentary about rewilding in Europe. Uh, they, they filmed all of the different rewilding areas across Europe and the work that's been, uh, that, that is being done there, including in the rewilding area I work in, in Portugal, which is the Greater Coa Valley. Uh, yes, I can send the link again. One sec. Oh, there you go. Thanks, Carolina. Okay, so let's start with the presentation. Okay. So today we are going to be talking about rewilding, which is a new approach to nature conservation, uh, both here in Europe and more globally. And just a quick introduction about the organization I work for, which is Rewilding Portugal. Uh, it's a new organization. It started in January of 2019, so at the start of last year, and it's based in Guarda, Portugal, which is a small city in the north of the country. We work in partnership with Rewilding Europe, which is a larger uh, Dutch organization that sort of coordinates uh, eight large rewilding areas all across Europe, and they are our strategic partner, and we work very closely with them. Uh, we have a common mission, so to say, which is, in our case, to make Portugal a wilder place. We are currently implementing two large scale projects in this region of the country, in the, in the Northern Central area. And we are focused on showcasing the rewilding approach and what rewilding can uh, bring that is different from more traditional approaches to wildlife conservation. Uh, here in the photos, you can see some of my uh, colleagues. So they are awesome. Some of them are here in the meeting today. Okay. Now, before we delve too deeply into what rewilding is, there's something that's really important and that I, I want to spend a few minutes talking about because it's a concept that I have a feeling is not clear to many people or it's not um, something that gets talked about a lot. And it's this thing called the shifting baseline syndrome. Uh, what is this? If you look at this graph on the screen, you can see that the vertical y-axis represents some good thing. 
And this good thing can be um, a habitat, can be clean water, can be a large forest, can be anything like a natural uh, resource, for instance. And then in the horizontal X axis, you can see that it's time, it's generations. And we can think of this in terms of human generations that, uh, that, that, that happen. And so what has been happening throughout time is that because of human impact on earth, a lot of these natural resources have been decreasing in, in abundance, in extent, uh, in area of occurrence, different parameters, but basically progressively there, there is less and less of a certain resource. Uh, some of these things have been uh, declining since the agricultural revolution, others only since the industrial revolution, but a lot of them, when we think about the natural world, um, is being lost and is still being lost nowadays. So what is the shifting baseline syndrome? This curve that represents uh, the decrease of this good thing, of this habitat, and I'm gonna stick with the forest as an example. Um, as generations go by, each new generation, we as children, we look at the world and we see how it is. And that becomes our baseline. Very often, many of you, I'm sure, have had the experience of talking to your grandparents and they're like, oh, in my time, this used to be like this and like that. Uh, there were no houses there. It was all just the, 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 the countryside and now everything is built up. Um, so as each generation grows up, they have a new baseline. The problem with that is that the baseline we grew up with is already so very far removed from how things used to be, even just two or three generations back. Uh, that we don't even we don't even perceive that we don't even realize that our baseline is already an extremely degraded state of affairs and when we're talking about the natural world even our grandparents and when our grandparents tell us how things used to be yes but even in our grandparents time things were already very very degraded uh, so the, we just we, we lose the memory in terms of human history we, we don't have the ability to really uh, understand how throughout time our baseline of how we think of what nature is or should be is. And this has very real impacts when it comes to how we go about conserving nature and protecting nature. Because we grew up thinking of nature as maybe a couple of national parks, maybe a couple of wilderness areas far off where no one lives. Um, the world has become so human dominated that we have less and less space for nature. And here in this next slide, you can see on the left hand side, um, another example, uh, a depiction of this shifting baseline syndrome. At the bottom, it's what the ocean looked like in the, around 1800 and at the top in 2019. So you can see in 2019, we have the addition of those white little plastic bags, lovely. But so this is it. When, when we think about what should we conserve, what is nature conservation, what is wildlife conservation, it's a human choice. We choose what to conserve and we choose how much of it, how much wildlife, how much space do we give nature. Uh, so so it's, it's deeper than just uh, preserving what is here because what is here now is already so much less than what there used to be. And that's something that rewilding uh, talks about, which is bringing nature back, bringing more nature back, making this planet a wilder place. Before we move on, uh, I wanna ask you a question. And um, I want you to think of all the mammals on earth. So this is all human beings, all the cows and the pigs, all of the domestic animals, and then all of the other mammals. So the whales, the rhinos, the elephants, the mice, all the mammals, right? Now imagine you put all of these uh, creatures on a balance and you weigh that. And, and the weight of all of these animals together, of all of us together, let's call it the biomass of mammals. And that's 100%. This is 100% of the biomass mass on earth. And now I have a question for you, which is if you had to split this percentage, this 100% between the percentage that corresponds to all human beings plus all human livestock and the percentage that corresponds to all other wild mammals on earth, what would you say the split is? And so here, give me split. So is it 50, 50, 40, 60, 10, 90? Give me a couple of guesses on the chat, please. Okay, so we've got 6%, 12%, 80, 20, 90, 10, less than 1%, 5%, okay. 
I'm guessing the lower percentages, you guys are telling me it's the wild mammals. <laughs> 2080, that's optimistic. <laughs> Any more guesses? All right, so. Humans account for about 36% of the biomass of all mammals, while domesticated livestock, mostly cows and pigs, account for 60%, which leaves 4% for wild mammals. This is from a study. Uh, I've included the URL at the bottom. I can share that on the chat later with you guys as well from the study that made these calculations. Um, and this also holds true for birds, the biomass of poultry, so chicken, is about three times higher than that of wild birds. Why, why does this matter? Yes, it is biomass, yes. Why, okay, sorry, my cat is, cat, no. <laughs> Shifting baseline syndrome. This is from the Living Planet report from WWF from this year, 2020. Um, and basically it shows that the population sizes of mammals, birds, fish, amphibians, and reptiles have seen an alarming average drop of 68% since 1970. That's 1970, which is 50 years ago. So it's an almost 70% decrease in population sizes. So there's a lot of talk nowadays around the extinction crisis and how uh, species are going extinct and also because of climate change and how that's gonna make it worse. And that's definitely uh, a huge issue and very concerning. And, the bio and we are going through the sixth mass extinction on earth at the moment. But something that isn't talked about as much is not species going extinct, but the decline in bioabundance, the decline in the numbers of each of the species that is still around. If you think lions, if you think wolves, if you think uh, elephants, sharks, whales, there used to be tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of animals. And these populations have been getting smaller and smaller and smaller throughout the last five decades, even before that, but since 1970, a 70% decline. Why? Because wildlife has fewer and fewer spaces left to live in, to thrive in, uh, humans keep occupying land and the land that is not occupied is explored. And we have such a massive impact on the planet that it's important to have this perception of really the scale of the problem uh, if we have any hope of actually doing anything about it that is going to, to, to have a real impact in our world. And it's also about what kind of a world do we want to live in? Do we want to live in a world where um, humans and livestock make up 96% of the mass of mammals. I mean, think about that. So we can, we can use these data then to decide what kind of a planet we want to live on, what kind of a society, what we want our children to see, what is the baseline that we want our children to have when it comes to nature. Okay, so now we're gonna move into the rewilding. What is rewilding and why do I love it? Uh, basically, it's a new approach to nature conservation. Traditionally, nature conservation or, or the conservation sector has been fairly reactive, so focused on conserving what is left. And the problem with, with that is that as impacts continue and there is less and less and less to protect, um, you end up having to put species on life support with costly conservation projects that cost millions and you're literally trying to prevent one species from going extinct while its habitat is probably burning at the same time. So rewilding is about moving from a reactive to a proactive approach to nature conservation and saying, okay, enough. It's not just about protecting what's left, it's about taking back, it's about restoring, it's about making nature wilder and allowing more space for nature to exist. And so this approach um, also focuses on establishing complete trophic chains. So a trophic chain is basically uh, all the different animals that go from the plants. So you have grass and then the rabbit eats the grass and then the fox eats the rabbit. And then when the fox dies comes a, a, a vulture and eats the, the fox. So all of these species, they form a chain and this is called a trophic chain. Um, so when certain, uh, certain species are missing from an ecosystem, from a habitat, and the trophic chains are not complete, you get ecosystems that are not at equilibrium. 
So for example, in the UK, you have this problem where because you don't have any wild predators, uh, you have an abundance of deer that is unnatural and then they need to be managed and controlled by people because there's nothing hunting them in the wild. Uh, other, so besides the trophic chains, there's also these, these natural processes. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what, what these natural processes are, but this includes grazing, predation, scavenging, things that occur in natural and healthy ecosystems, but that often are missing from our human modified landscapes. This spiral uh, sort of represents the idea of rewilding. If you look at the top left side, this represents wild nature before man. As the spiral moves into the right, you can see a, a human-like figure hunting a deer. Uh, then we move into agriculture, human exploration of nature, the agricultural revolution. Eventually, we go into more um, urban and modern exploration and at the bottom, at the bottom here of this image, you have what rewilding is proposing, which is not a return to what nature used to be like before humans, because that's that's not possible. We're here and we're part of nature as well. But what it proposes is that we find a way to live and coexist with the rest of nature, that we don't take over all of the space, but that we find ways to live more harmoniously with, with wildlife. And that's something that nowadays is a more real opportunity because of the concentration in cities. So there's this global movement, people going into cities, more and more of the human population uh, is moving to cities. And so this is freeing up actually large areas of countryside uh, that used to be used for uh, subsistence, uh, subsistence or small scale agriculture and that are being abandoned. So this creates an opportunity to use those spaces in a different way uh, that is still uh, that still brings benefits to people, as we will see, uh, but that allows more space for nature to thrive in. So now I'm just going to tell you a little bit about some of these natural processes that rewilding um, focuses on. One of them is grazing. Grazing is fundamental to maintain habitat heterogeneity and a variety of plant species. And in Europe in particular, there used to be uh, large herbivores. Large herbivores includes taurus, which used to be the ancestor of cattle. Uh, large cattle included um, bison. So large species that had a, a, a large impact also on, on their ecosystem. Basically, their keystone species, like here in this image of the taurus, you can see sort of like the effects that they have on this habitat. They break up the vegetation, so they sort of stop or delay the, the vegetation succession process, um, creating a mosaic of habitats, which is creating new niches for more biodiversity. So these keystone large herbivore species are beneficial to a lot of other species in those habitats. Um, one of the things that happens here in Portugal, for instance, is that because we don't have these large herbivores and even smaller herbivores are not so abundant, uh, you get areas with uh, bush encroachment where vegetation grows uh, very, very um, uh, quickly and then it burns. So in Portugal, as some of you may know, we have serious issues with wildfires, rural fires, um, not only because of uh, bush encroachment, which is an issue, but also because of monocultures, uh, eucalyptus and pine monocultures that burn very easily. So these are not native trees. Uh, they are planted in an unnatural way. And then when you get a spark, tragedies happen. So these large herbivores can have positive impacts, not only for biodiversity, um, but also by preventing this accumula accumulation of biomass that leads to these very large out of control fires, it can have a very clear positive impact for people as well. Then grazers are also important to sustain scavenging uh, species and predators. Again, this goes back to the fact that there's a role for every species in these trophic chains. Um, rabbits, which are small grazers, are such a critical species because they are food for a lot of other things. 
the Iberian lynx, for example, which is a threatened species which occurs only in Spain and Portugal, uh, their main source of food is, is the rabbit. So again, scavenging is another one of those. When you have um, scavengers in the ecosystem, they sort of function like a, a cleanup crew. They remove dead bodies from the ecosystem. Uh, an interesting example we have here in Portugal and in other European countries as well is that they've started to, when, when there was that whole issue with the mad cow disease, uh, they implemented sort of very strict sanitary regulations. So when, a, when an animal, a domestic animal, a cow or uh, sheep, pigs, when they die, you can't just leave them out in the open. You either have to bury them or you need to contact like a specialized service that comes and takes the body away and then burns it, I think. Um, the problem with that, with that is that with very low levels of wildlife and no livestock carcasses being left in the field, the populations of scavenging birds uh, also declined alarmingly. And this is something uh, that is being reversed now. And in Portugal, there's some good news with that because uh, there's a new action plan and some new le le legislation which allows for some farms to leave the bodies of the domestic animals out in the field. But obviously the ideal situation is that there is enough wildlife out there that these scavenging birds can feed on that and they don't, they don't need to rely so heavily on livestock. Okay, so that was about rewilding in general. And now I want to tell you guys about two specific projects which Rewilding Portugal and, and its partners are working on. And the first one is about the Iberian wolf and ensuring its long-term viability south of the Douro River. So, uh, in Portugal, in the 1930s, there used to be wolves in the Algarve. You can see here in these maps how the population of wolves in Portugal has evolved throughout the years. And again, it's the same as with many other species. There's a clear decline. And nowadays, the species is only found in northern Portugal. So according to the last national census of the species in the country, which is quite old, it's from 2002, 2003, uh, there were around um, 300 wolves in Portugal, right? 300. But they're split. They're split by the Douro River. If you see in the map, the Douro River is sort of like that northernmost river, not the ones in the top corner, but the one that goes horizontally, the northernmost one. That's the Douro River. Most species, uh, most uh, wolves are found north of the Douro. Where, I, I can use the mouse? Ah, okay. okay. Ah, here, this is the Douro, thanks. Um, north of the Douro is where most wolves are found. South of the Douro, the situation is quite different. Uh, you, we only have a few packs, certainly fewer than 50 wolves, and these packs are scattered and isolated. And it, it's, it's a subpopulation that is at risk uh, of extinction because it faces a number of threats in this, in this area. And it needs, it needs some work to ensure that it will um, stay there in the long term. So that's what our project is, is focused on. Okay, so what are the threats to the wolf in this area? First of all, it is an area that is highly modified by people. Um, that is conflict with livestock breeders because again, uh, one of the main economic activities in the region is agriculture and is raising livestock, um, cows, sheep and goats mostly. Uh, and there aren't that many wild prey available. So what, what does the Iberian wolf eat? It eats roe deer, which is this little buddy. It eats deer, uh, but deer are not really found in most of its distribution area south of the Douro River. It eats wild boar, uh, which is more available. But the current situation in the region is that there, there are a lot of livestock attacks. So the wolf um, targets and kills uh, some, some domestic animals. And obviously the livestock breeders uh, who rely on these animals to make their living naturally have an issue with this. And there is a national system of payments to farmers who have suffered these attacks. So the state uh, pays if you have had an attack from a wolf. But the problem with this is that it doesn't work very well. And so people, people, people feel frustrated, which is natural. Uh, the wolf, the Iberian wolf is a protected species in Portugal. It's actually the only species in Portugal that has dedicated legislation um, to protect it. And um, we as the Portuguese people, we want to have 
uh, we want to have the wolf, but we, we, we can't do that at the expense of these people that are trying to make a living, often in very difficult conditions. It's, it's a rural, interior, interior, rather poor area. It's not everywhere the same, but basically the, the problem with the system of payments not working well is that people get increasingly frustrated and may decide to take matters into their own hands. And illegal persecution and killing of wolves is a problem and can happen. Even, recent, even as recently as 2014, there were rumors that some wolves were killed in this region. So working with these livestock breeders and helping them to protect their livestock from wolf attacks is, is a critical aspect of our work. And we do this by, um, by giving these cute guys livestock guarding dogs to farmers. Livestock guarding dogs have been in use for many years. They're an ancient tradition in the region. They go with the flock. They, well, they, they need to be put with these uh, flocks and herds when they are little, like this little guy whose name is Nero. Um, so they, they grow up with the animals and they become part of the herd or they become part of the flock. So they identify with the, with the animals and they protect them from wolves. And they can be an extremely effective tool uh, to do that. We also build fences or help farmers build fences that are wolf proof. Um, most farmers have some sort of fencing to keep the sheep in. The problem is that that fencing is pretty much always insufficient to keep an Iberian wolf out. They can jump pretty high. So they need better fences to make sure that the animals are protected, especially at night when they are most vulnerable, those that are kept outside. What else? Um, a lack of wild prey is also is also an issue, like I was saying. So we are also working to try and um, make population reinforcements of roe deer, because roe deer is one of the key prey species for the Iberian wolf. And throughout much of this area where we are working on, the densities are very, very low. So we want to bring more of these roe deer in. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a two-pronged approach. So you bring more wild prey and you protect better the domestic animals. And so you sort of steer the wolf into the wild prey direction. We also have a surveillance team, which is a team of two people that um, do surveillance in some priority areas. They are looking for illegal traps. Something that is very common here are these sort of like wire traps to catch wild boar. The problem with that is that it can catch a wild boar, it can catch a dog, it can catch a wolf, and these are illegal. Um, and they'll also be helping to detect rural fires in the summer months. So these are a few of the actions of this project. And now I will move on to the next one. So the second one is more uh, focused on a different region, which is the Great Rakoa Valley, which is found close to the border with Spain between the Douro in the north and the Malkata Mountains in the south. So it's sort of like a little valley here. I don't think I have a map. I do, I do have a map, right? Yes, here's the map. Okay, so this is Spain. This is the Douro. These are the Malcata region, the Malcata mountains. This is Guarda here, where rewilding Portugal is based. And this is Serra da Estrela, which some of you might recognize the name. So the Greater Coa Valley, as you can see, um, there's this river here going throughout the valley. This is the Coa River. And the Coa River, the hydrographic basin of the Coa River is what we call uh, the, the, the Greater Coa Valley. This is a natural corridor for wildlife. It always has been. Um, and we are trying to work to strengthen it. Uh, how? As, you, as you'll see here on this map, uh, we have these areas which are shaded in, in red. These have been identified as key areas, as core areas that have um, very good habitat left. And that would be important to protect, to ensure that they don't get taken up by different land uses. For instance, in this region, a land use that is increasing quite rapidly is, is extensive cattle breeding, so cows in, in an extensive regime. Whereas extensive cattle breeding um, is much better than intensive cattle breeding for many different reasons. Uh, we do want to make sure that we are protecting some of these key and core areas throughout the Coa Valley um, to, you know, leave a little bit of space for wildlife, like we were discussing before. So we want to basically buy land in some of these core areas and create small 
protected areas. Here in core area number one, if you see this little bit in green, this is the Faya Brava Reserve. The Faya Brava Reserve is a protected area and it is the only um, private protected area in the country. It is managed by Associação Transhumância e Natureza, which are one of our partners. Um, and so basically we want to replicate that model throughout the Coa Valley to ensure that these areas where there is good habitat left or that has regenerated since it has been abandoned, et cetera, that we can protect it for the future. Besides that, um, so the private reserve, the Faya Bravo one is around 800 hectares. So not massive, we're not talking like Yellowstone and Serengeti here, but <laughs> different scales in Europe. But anyway, it's still fantastic. And if you visit, it's, it's really impressive. You have like these large canyons and you can see large griffin vultures soaring and it's pretty cool. And they have um, semi-wild horses and uh, maronesa cows as well, which are very cool. If you're just like in a car going through the reserve and all of a sudden there's like wild horses, it's pretty cool, come visit. So, ah, another one of the things we want to do is to build a nature-based economy. And what is a nature-based economy? So a rewilding enterprise or a nature-based enterprise is a business that either directly or indirectly generates finance, incentives, or engagement for rewilding. So basically a business that somehow has a positive impact on wilder nature or the comeback of wildlife. Um, many different types of businesses can be uh, um, nature-based enterprises. Here we go. <laughs> um, for example, obviously the most the most obvious one, ecotourism, everything around wildlife watching, uh, eco resorts, all of that. But also the production of high quality regional products can be a nature based enterprise if the way it is going about the production of those goods is sustainable and is better for the environment than many of the alternatives. An example. Um, I can mention is in the Greater Kuo Valley, there's a, a producer of almonds, a small scale producer of almonds, and they use native varieties of almonds. And the way that they go about it is like way more sustainable than your general almond producing plantation, which is not very sustainable at all. So it's all about how you go about doing things and having a positive impact for nature. Um, Rewilding Europe has this thing called the Rewilding Europe Capital, and it's Europe's first rewilding enterprise funding facility. So it's about funding these enterprises uh, that are having a positive impact for rewilding. They've already supported 152 enterprises, uh, provided 21 loans, they've provided more than 2 million euros in loans, um, and so they are putting their money where their mouth is in terms of trying to develop in the different rewilding areas throughout Europe an economy that is more nature friendly and that can also show that nature and people are not mutually exclusive and that people don't need to leave in order for nature to come back. So these businesses, um, especially the ones around tourism, also play a very key role in sort of raising awareness to people who come to these rewilding areas about the work that is being carried out in those regions, about these different um, business models, about this different way of approaching how we use land and how we value uh, the, the natural heritage that we have uh, in the region. Then there's also this thing called the European Safari Company, which you should also check out. Uh, the European Safari Company organizes tours and visits to the different European rewilding areas, including ours, so including the Greater Coa Valley. Um, and they have very cool programs where you go and make and, and do tours with um, dedicated wildlife tour operators. You stay at places that are close to the areas we are working on, and then you get to visit these areas and see uh, the work that is being done. So here in Portugal, you can visit the Faya Brava Reserve with the European Safari Company. Um, and, and also, yeah, well, soon you'll be able to visit more areas along the Greater Coa Valley. <laughs> so rewilding is a growing network in Europe. There's a European rewilding network, which is composed of 62 different rewilding um, initiatives across Europe. You can see here in the map where they are found. Uh, they have sort of criteria 
that you need to meet to be able to join this European rewilding network. Um, but if you meet those criteria, then you, you join the network and you have access to a lot of information. They, they very regularly hold webinars, which are very informative. Um, and so they're already, this European rewilding network is already present in 27 European countries uh, with initiatives that involve 5 million hectares. But this is not just a European thing, it's also a global movement. And there are, thing, there are organizations like Rewilding Argentina, Rewilding Australia, probably more. I've included the links here below as well, which we can share. Um, this idea, this narrative of bringing nature back and making some places uh, wilder is, is, is very positive, I think. And it's something that we can all sort of rally behind when it comes to having a more positive outlook for the future and, and, and thinking about the kind of uh, planet that we want to live for our children. So what can you do? Nothing too revolutionary um, here. Help us spread the word. Rewilding is uh, it's a fairly new thing. It's sort of getting a bit of traction now, but it's still new in the, in the whole nature conservation uh, field and beyond it, especially beyond it. So help us spread the word. When everyone talks about climate change, let's also talk about rewilding, rewilding and, 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 and fixing climate change. Uh, you can go work for an organization that is focused on rewilding. There are a few people here in the webinar today that work in nature conservation. So come work with us. But obviously, uh, most of you don't work uh, in the nature conservation sector, but your organizations or companies can still be a huge help by giving in-kind uh, support to rewilding organizations. This can be pro bono uh, legal services, pro bono whatever services, but getting involved with a rewilding organization or even funding through your corporate responsibility uh, programs uh, small rewilding projects or interventions in one of these rewilding areas can have a huge impact. The involvement of the private sector is absolutely crucial to, to, to make this work. And another thing, if you, if you work for a company or, or an organization that owns land, um, one thing you might consider is, okay, how could we rewild or make our land better for biodiversity? That's also something that rewilding organizations can give support uh, and information about. And then you can help us finance the work of rewilding to scale up its impact. So yeah, again, through corporate responsibility uh, projects or, or any other thing. But that's it, like get involved, take an interest, ask questions, find out in your area what's happening in terms of rewilding. Maybe nothing is, maybe you can get something started. If we all work together, then <laughs> we can do that. So that's it for my presentation. I've already taken uh, 40 minutes of your time. So I'll stop sharing my screen and I will open the floor for questions. Question from Kate Jones. Hi, Kate. How have you found engagement with farmers? Okay, that's an awesome question. Uh, so for me, actually, it was eye-opening because I came from an urban environment, right? I'd never, I've never really lived in the countryside before. And when I came here, one of the first things that we did was do this social attitude study, me and my colleagues, where we would go out and interview people. And we interviewed a lot of hunters, a lot of farmers about what their thoughts, opinions, experiences were with the species, with the Iberian wolf, with the roe deer, what did they think about this and that in nature. Um, and what, what we found is that often people feel like they're not really uh, listened to. So here in the rural interior, interior of country, there's this perception that like Lisbon makes the decisions and then people here need to deal with them and that their interests are not really taken into account, they are not listened to. And all of these um, frustrations also around the Iberian wolf uh, sort of came up. And when it comes to engaging with them, obviously farmers are, can be very different. Some people are extremely positive about the wolf, even though they have had several attacks and several of their animals have been killed. Other people who have never had any attack are completely against the wolf and think they should all be killed. So there's a diversity of, uh, of perceptions, of, of, of ideas, of, uh, points of view 
And it's always about trying to find a common denominator, something that we can agree on. Um, so generally, I think that we have been finding it interesting i don't think there's very few people where you can't engage with where they where, where you can't have a conversation or where you, people are people are just people and if you talk to them for a while then you know you can get along with them even if they i get along with some people who have very very um negative uh attitudes towards the iberian wolf but it's all about creating a relationship and sort of gaining their trust and trying to show them that it is possible for the wolf to be there uh, without being a huge problem for them. And then we try to work with them to protect their animals, etc. Maybe we could find ways to cooperate. What type of projects were funded to promote ecotourism? Um, okay, so when it comes to promoting, to funding, to funding projects, um, Right now, in terms of funding, there's these, these rewilding Europe capital facility that funds some businesses and they've funded some um, touristic projects here in the Coa Valley. So there's Wildlife Portugal, which is a touristic operator and they've been financed through this. There's a new one coming up called Baldas Lobach, which is going to be like this eco new age resort thing, which sounds awesome. It's going to have something called the goddess pool. I don't know. Um, but so basically they are looking for enterprises that are commercially viable, that have a good business plan, and that are also going to do something positive for, for nature. So in the, in the example of this Valdez Lobos one, they're going to create a large biodiversity park where they're going to promote wildlife comeback, etc. Um, we also give more in-kind support to businesses. So we have an enterprise officer at Rewilding Portugal that gives technical support to the different businesses in the Greater Coa Valley. Um, by working with them to determine how they could expand their operations, what their needs are in terms of human and financial resources, et cetera. So then from Russ Carrington, how does setting land aside for rewilding balance with the need for producing more food for the growing global, growing global population? Yes, so that's always, that's always a question, like there's more people, we need to feed more people, how are we going to do that? Um, that's a very complex issue. So I'm sorry if my answer isn't going to be um, perfect on that, but I would say that it goes through a few different things. First, let's reduce food waste. There's ridiculous amounts of food waste all around the, all, all around the planet. We already produce food to feed more than enough all of the people that are alive today. We waste a bunch of it. So new strategies need to be found um, to reduce food waste. Then um, you already have a lot of good techniques to produce a lot of food. Um, in these areas, for example, in the Greater Coa Valley, a lot of these, um, the soil, like it's not great for crops. These are marginal lands for agriculture. We're not talking about like prime real estate. A lot of these areas are very rocky. You can't even grow much on it. So it's either growing livestock in extensive regimes or there's not really much else that they are growing in terms of, of agricultural produce there. Um, and even for the cows, Obviously, that's another issue, which is the unsustainable levels of meat consumption globally, which need to be reduced if we want to have, you know, a planet in the future. Um, but so there's a few different things, and it's not because we are protecting areas that are a few hundred hectares or a few thousand hectares in a region that that's going to take away food from anyone's mouth or that we're not going to be able to feed the, the, the global population. It's about redistribution of resources. It's about not wasting food, and it's about being smarter about where and how we farm. Um, that's actually a huge issue in Europe at the moment because they are reforming the, the, the CAP, the cultural agricultural policy, and the proposal they have on the table right now is not in line with the Green New Deal that they are proposing for Europe. And it's more business as usual, which is giving a lot of subsidies uh, to a few people. So the largest farms get most subsidies. Uh, it's not sustainable for nature. It's not sustainable for people. It's not equitable. So a bunch of issues with it, very complex issue. But just to reiterate, it's not because we protect a few thousand hectares that you can't grow enough food to feed people. What else here? Hold on. Uh, are there opportunities for rewilding, at least in terms of fauna in urban areas like parks, for example? Yes. So rewilding is about um, diminishing human impact, right? And, and bringing more nature 
to an area. So if you have an urban area, an urban park, you can have very different things from a huge park where all you have is one species of grass that is constantly mowed and a few trees here and there, like a completely manicured, unnatural thing, or you can have a, a, a park that is more resembling of the native uh, local fauna and flora, where you, you plant native bushes and trees that give flowers and then bring the pollinators, which bring the birds, which, you know, there are some great examples of parks, can't name any off the top of my head, uh, where if you compare two parks, you can see clearly that one is a lot more uh, wild than the other one. It's all about how you go about managing it. Again, it's all about human intervention um, and letting nature sort of thrive without so much intervention from our side. But so yeah, even your garden, like you can rewild your garden if you plant a few more bushes which have native flowers, again, the pollinators, again, the birds, like there are a few things that you can do uh, and that have a huge impact. Next. Have you had any issues with the term rewilding? I have often found it hard to steer clear from unproductive conversations about the definition of rewilding, most often with fellow conservationists. Do you have any resistance from other nature conservation organizations that are very tied to conservation through micromanagement? So yes, very, very interesting question. Rewilding is sort of like the new kid on the block in a sense. And there is some resistance for more traditional nature conservation organizations um, because we're proposing something slightly different from the way things have been done until now. So it's, it's a change. And obviously people sometimes resist the, those changes. Um, micromanagement is definitely an issue. And even in Europe, you have this, this problem that European legislation, the Habitats Directive, uh, often forces you to, to have these micromanagement approaches to maintain a habitat exactly as it is and not letting it move on, not letting it change, just keeping it like that. And that sometimes requires a pretty constant human intervention. One of the things Rewilding says is, there is no definite endpoint. This shouldn't just look like this forever. No, nature evolves. Nature is always changing. Change is the constant. Uh, and natural landscapes and habitats and species assemblages, all of this is in constant flux, in constant change. And so Rewilding says that, whereas very often more traditional nature conservation approaches are focused on maintaining the status quo and not letting things change so much because then you lose that thing that you're trying to, to conserve. But again, I think embracing change is, is positive. Um, here in Portugal, because we're also a fairly new uh, conservation organization, we're still not very well known nationally. We're starting to get there, but um, we'll see. Uh, we'll see. I haven't had um, any unproductive conversations yet. But I think sometimes people also get a bit focused on the more extreme definitions of, of rewilding because you know it's also a range of what people propose. Like Georges Monbiot um, is in favor of bringing elephants back to Europe. Well, I mean, he says that in his book, like what about bringing elephants back to Europe, which obviously probably not going to happen, um, but it's an interesting idea. Eleanor, this is a question about the negative impact of more road deer on trees. So I'm aware that it is a British perspective. So the wolf numbers will increase and control the road deer. Uh, again, do you have an idea of time scale for these things? Is there tree planting in the interim to reduce impact? Okay, yeah. So road deer can have um, impacts on some tree plantations, especially when the trees are young. In the greater Coa Valley and in the areas where we work, this is not a huge problem because there are not that many tree plantations, except in very specific areas most of the area, um, there wouldn't be much of a damage. Also in terms of the abundance of the roe deer, you wouldn't see the same sorts of effects as, as in the UK in the, in, in the short term, for sure. Uh, obviously the ideal would be that the prey and predator populations sort of grow together to prevent then the herbivores from starting to have this uh, bigger negative impact on, on the ecosystems but we are still a, a ways off from that in, in here, I think, in this region. Uh, great initiative. Thank you for bringing this alive in this webinar. How is the Rewilding Initiative funded and how are donations, results, presented and audited? Okay, 
So currently our work is financed through, uh, through these two large projects. One is financed through the LIFE program of the European Union, uh, so it's communitary funds. And the other one is funded by uh, uh, the Endangered Landscapes program, which are private funds that come from a foundation called Arcadia, and it's a philanthropic fund. Um, all of our results, we're a nonprofit organization, so all of our accounts are audited annually, and then those results are made public. Uh, thanks for your answer, but can we aim for greater areas rewilding and maybe incorporate elements of rewilding into agriculture? Ah, that's a very interesting point there, Russ. That's one of my pet things is, is rewilding agriculture, because for sure you can rewild agriculture, organic agriculture, regenerative agriculture, all of these things are way better than regular uh, intensive approaches to how we grow our food. Uh, so yes, definitely. Obviously, we will still need to have large agricultural areas, but there are a lot of things that we can do in those areas to make them better for wildlife. And, and agricultural areas used to be, like maybe also 50 years ago, a lot better for wildlife than they are today. And as we've become more focused on, on the production of larger amounts of food and intensification of practices, et cetera, et cetera, uh, we've been making agricultural land more and more uh, bare of, of wildlife. So for sure, rewilding agriculture, organic, regenerative, um, that, that supporting those sorts of things while not losing out on food production is what we should be trying to do on a larger scale because these sorts of approaches are still very um, small scale. I, I think organic farming is growing in Europe, but it's still not anywhere near what it should be to have a wilder uh, Europe. <laughs> Do you face issues with private property interrupting conservation areas? Yes, well, uh, in Portugal, pretty much everything is privately owned uh, and we have protected areas, so Natura 2000 sites, which are designated at the national level, but these areas include a lot of private property. And the way that this is managed is that there are some restrictions when your private property is found within one of these protected areas in a tour 2000 site, for example, there are some restrictions in terms of what you can and can't do. Um, but obviously it's not, uh, it's not an airtight system and there are a lot of issues with it. Uh, so the, the best way to actually protect land in Portugal is to own it because ownership comes with all the rights. So I know this is not the same in all the countries, but in Portugal, pretty much if you own a piece of land, you have, almost all the rights on it. Okay. Okay. Thank you, guys. All right. So we are almost at the hour, five minutes to go. Thank you for your questions, guys. If there are any more, I still have a few minutes to be here. Otherwise, ah, wait, wait. I wanted to show you another video before you go. Okay. So this one, this one, you have to watch this one. It's a documentary which we have been working on about our area. I'm putting the YouTube link there as well so you can watch it. it this is the trailer and it's coming out at the end of the month. It will be available on YouTube. Uh, so stay tuned. It's called Rewilding, a new path for nature in Portugal. Thank you guys. You've been great. You've made some great questions. Okay, from Juan Uribe, do you find agriculture to be more problematic or raising livestock? So I can only speak to our local context, which is here in the Greater Coa Valley, uh, and raising livestock is, a, is, is much more predominant here. Uh, so large areas are being taken up to have these cattle farms to do extensive cattle breeding. Uh, and because extensive cattle breeding and, and is being supported and subsidized quite heavily by the European Commission, it is a very attractive um, proposition to farmers uh, to, to, to do that, because basically you get money per cow. So it's one of the issues. A lot of land is being taken up at the moment for that. Uh, from Zane, is there something we can do in our everyday capacity to help this initiative? Yes, help us spread the word, help make rewilding a household name. Uh, that's the easiest one. Follow our work, help us share our news, stay tuned. Thank you, guys.
Um, yes, we, we've also made a recording of this webinar, so we will share that with you guys and with the people who couldn't be here today. Okay, I'll say goodbye then. Thank you very much. Cheers, guys. Bye.